glorify your great name. Lord, we ask that even as we have gathered together this morning, Lord, that you would be in our midst. Yes. Lord, that even across uh, these uh, virtual waves, uh, Lord, that you would uh, uh, bless our time of gathering. You would bless each and every person that is here, each and every person that is listening. We pray for those who might even be scrolling across Facebook and come across this feed. And we pray that something that is said and something that is done might be a blessing unto them today. Father, our heart's desire is, as you have said, that none would perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of you. So Father, transform us. Um, not only save us, but Lord, sanctify us. Yes. Work within us, Lord. Yes. Um, we don't want to be the same that we were last year or the day before, but Father, we want to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of God. And so, Father, where our faith is weak, would you strengthen us? Father, where we, Lord, are, are, are seeking for wisdom, would you show us the way? Father, where we are downcast, would you strengthen us and uplift our hearts, oh God? Father, where there are broken places, Lord, would you bring healing and deliverance and would you set us free, oh God, so that we may go forth to do everything that you've called for us to do. And so, Father, as we worship your name, as we study your word today, Lord, be in our midst. Yes. In Christ Jesus' name we do yes. pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. and amen. amen. And amen. Well, we are so excited today that as we uh, gather together, um, we've been blessed over these last uh, several weeks um, to be able to have uh, special presentations from our worship department. Um, and um, uh, as we um, start off normally with our service, with a time of worship together, um, an opportunity for us to sing together and uh, join in worship together, uh, it's been such a blessing to have. Uh, these special presentations by our worship team that we can sing with them, we can worship with them, and uh, we can um, bless the name of the Lord. And so this week, we're privileged to um, uh, have a song by uh, Minister uh, Tasha Cobb Leonard, um, who uh, wrote the song called Gracefully Broken. And um, this week, as our music department presents it, um, we're also happy to have um, a, a, a newcomer to our worship team, but an awesome um, minister of music and worship. Um, I was gonna call her Minister Joanne Brown, uh, but uh, uh, Sister Joanne Brown uh, leading um, today's um, presentation. And so um, I want you to join in uh, again um, because of the um, uh, 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 time uh, 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 delay a little bit. Uh, we'll ask that uh, you sing out loudly, um, but you do it on mute so that um, we don't have a little bit of the off sync. But we want you to sing out loudly and sing with the worship team as we um, uh, sing uh, today. And as Brother Luis said, if you have a headphone, uh, you can uh, put that in and you can hear uh, some of the beautiful dynamics that uh, our audio and uh, musicians have put together, Sister Shireen, Brother Luis, and also um, uh, um, Brother uh, Kevin, uh, who uh, uh, edited and put this together. Amen. <laughs> Take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire, set me on fire, Sing. take all I have in these hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire here I
Can we give thanks for our worship team and our praise team this morning and for all uh, the work that went into uh, this presentation. Um, I'm reminded of the words um, of the prophet uh, Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter number 18. Um, it says, the Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He says, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel, but the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message. Oh, Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to the, his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. There is this constant reminder that, you know, oftentimes we fear brokenness. We mm -hmm. fear, um, you know, kind of the, <laughs> the imperfections um, that, you know, oftentimes we try to kind of cover up or, you know, even as you display it in the room, or I think of my kids who their imperfections, they try and hide in a closet or, you know, try and push away. And so much like that, we do that with much of our lives before Almighty God. But this song reminds us that we are gracefully broken. Mm -hmm. And the same one who sees every imperfection mm -hmm. invites us to come, not to hide those imperfections, not to hide um, those things, but to come just as we are, to come even in the midst mm -hmm. of, you know, we've come a thousand times before, but he come, invites us to come the thousand and one time mm -hmm. again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And he allows us to say, let me, take you into the potter's hand like the potter's wheel and of course in the process of that sometimes the lord has to break us before he can mold us again 
And some of us, we fear that breaking. We fear that time where the Lord will come in and, and, and it seems like things are being ruptured. But I come here to remind you that just as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you yes, in the yes, hands yes, of yes. Almighty God. Yes, the yes. word of the prophet Jeremiah, the, the word went out to him that just like the potter will take this clay yes, and make it beautiful. Yes, God makes everything yes, beautiful yes, in its time. Yes, yes, so I don't know what whatever yes, things you have on the potter's wheel this morning. Maybe it's you who are on the potter's wheel this morning. I don't know, maybe it's your family that's on the potter's wheel this morning. Maybe it's your job, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's a situation that you're going through this morning. Whatever is on the potter's wheel, would you allow God to mold it and to shape it into what he desires because we know that God does not make mistakes. He makes everything beautiful. And so the beauty of his handiwork, may that be presented unto you even today. He's a great molder yeah. and we are gracefully broken. So what does that mean? We have to surrender. Uh, 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 as, as, as Minister Joanne reminded us, I surrender all. Yeah. I surrender, surrender. I That means to say, Lord, I give it over to yeah. you. And some of us, we fear surrender because it's a place of vulnerability. It's a place where we might not feel fully in control. But I come here to remind you that you're not surrendering mm -hmm. to something nebulous. You're not just surrendering and wondering, Lord, what will happen with me, but you're surrendering to the one who promises and says, I have a plan and a hope and a future for you. You're surrendering to the one who says, won't I, the God of all the universe, do what is, which is good and just and right? Do you know that the plans that the Lord has for you are good and, and worthy? I know oftentimes we look at God as the one who is looking down, looking for us to fail, but I I want you to know that God is the one who's looking down and hoping for you to succeed. He's hoping to make your path straight. He's hoping to make sure that every place that you go, every place that your foot will tread, that it will bring glory and honor to his great name. So this morning, we don't fear surrender. We don't fear giving everything over to God. But we say, yes, to his will and yes to his way come on if you believe it this morning one more time let's give thanks unto the lord and bless his holy name today hallelujah lord we thank you we bless you and we honor you in jesus great and mighty name again i want to just thank god um uh as uh i think sister Grace said, uh, y'all got some pipes, amen. Oh, that was Sister Anna, amen. And so uh, wasn't that a beautiful, beautiful, um, just, um, uh, you know, song. You know, it's, the other day I was, uh, um, Pastor Ophelia was playing a recording of the uh, of the team as they were, uh, had sung one of the songs. And uh, I asked Pastor O, and I was, uh, well, actually, sorry, it was the original version of one of the songs. I was like, Pastor O, is that the Mars Hill version? And she was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and she was like, no, that's, that's you know, the original version, but uh, I'm just so thankful. Um, and also, um, you know, we often, you know, see the people who are singing up front, but I also thank the people who are behind the scenes that have um, edited, um, put together the video, um, sequence, um, all the uh, uh, the harmonies, the synthesizer, all the, uh, uh, the seats, amen, <laughs> uh, the piano, every single thing. We're so, we are blessed. Um, we are tremendously blessed um, to have an awesome music ministry, and I'm so thankful for all of our ministers of music, and we look forward to hearing more um, selections from Sister Joanne, uh, Sister Taja, Pastor Ophelia, and the whole team uh, as we continue to worship the Lord. And so we'll post a video on YouTube a little bit later for those of you who want to either share it or um, listen again and worship 
uh, with the team again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, uh, at this time, I invite you to open uh, your Bibles um, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 23. 1 Samuel, chapter number 23. Um, you know, I'm excited about uh, uh, the study of the word of God. You know, each week, um, you know, we have the chapter divisions and, you know, sometimes the chapters are shorter than others. And sometimes I'm wondering, okay, you know, is there going to be enough to get through um, this week? And every time as we kind of unpack uh, the word of God, there's so many rich truths that are in the word of God. And um, uh, this week is uh, uh, no exception to that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of action. Um, there's a lot of, you know, I like action movies. Um, I like um, uh, uh, Jason Bourne and, and, and 24 and, you know, uh, movies like that. And so this week reminds me a little bit of that as um, David is on the run. Um, and it kind of, you know, it kind of has that Jason Bourne feel um, to it. He's, he's on the run and, and every place that he goes, he, uh, escapes um, Saul. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because every place he's going, there's also spies there who are, are telling of uh, David's location back to Saul. And um, so it's a little bit of a thriller um, as we go through 1 Samuel chapter number 23. Um, but there's also a spiritual dynamic that is here in 1 Samuel 23, which reminds us that when the Lord makes a promise, he knows how to fulfill his word. Um, and one of the things that I am so thankful for is that when God says yes, his yes is yes and amen. And, and um, he, will, he will move heaven and earth in order to make sure that his word is fulfilled. And so um, I'm going to invite you to uh, turn in your Bible to 1 Samuel uh, chapter number 23. And uh, for those of you who would like to read along, we'll have it on the screen, um, but also you can uh, download a copy of the uh, notes from today. Uh, if you go to our Facebook page, you'll see uh, a copy of the link uh, for today's um, notes. And so um, we're going to read um, together uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 23. There's 29 um, verses, and uh, uh, as is our custom, um, we'll have a few of you uh, help us um, uh, in the reading uh, today. And if I can get my mouse working correctly. I apologize. And so let me suck it here. There we go. All right. So, um, okay. So if we can have verses one uh, through six, um, if we'll have Sister Grace, if you can read verses one through six and then verses seven uh, through verse number 14, we'll ask um, Sister Davida if you can read uh, that. Uh, verse 15 uh, through verse number 23, if we can have... Um, uh, Sister Joanne, um, read that, and then verses 24 um, through 29, uh, Brother David, if you can read that. Okay. So we'll start at the beginning here. All right. When David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Kayla and are looting the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? The Lord answered him, go, attack the Philistines and save Kayla. But David's men said to him, here in Judah, we are afraid. How much more than if we go to Kayla against the Philistine forces? Once again, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, go down to Kayla, for I'm going to give the Philistines into your hand. So David and his men went to Kayla, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Kayla. Now Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, had brought the ephod down with him when he fled to David at Kayla. Saul was told that David had gone to Kayla, and he said, God has handed him over to me, for David has imprisoned himself by entering a town 
with gates and bars. And Saul called up all his forces for battle to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring the ephod. David said, O Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will. Again, David asked, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, they will. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he did not go there. David stayed in the desert strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Mm. Don't be afraid, he said. My father, Saul, will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained in Horesh. The Zephites went up to Saul at Gebeah and said, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh on the hill of Hakilah, south of Jeshimon? Now... Your majesty, come down whenever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for giving him into your hands. Saul replied, the Lord bless you for your concern for me. Go and get more information. Find out where David usually goes and who has seen him there. They tell me he is very crafty. Find out about all the hiding places he uses and come back to me with definite information then I will go with you. If he is in this in the area, I will track him down among all the clans of Judah. So they set out and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the desert of Maon in the Ar Arabah, south of Jeshimon. Saul and his men began the search, and when David was told about it, he went down to the rock, and he stayed in the desert of Maon. When Saul heard this, he went into the desert of Maon in pursuit of David. Saul was going along one side of the mountain, and David and his men <clears throat> excuse me, were on the other side, hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul saying, come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. Then Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to meet the Philistines. That is why they call this place Selah. Um, Hamalakatha. Okay. <laughs> Take your word for it. <laughs> and, and David went up from there and he lived in the strongholds of Engedi. Amen. Amen. Um, so, you know, no shame in it. I, I go to the Bible, online Bible, and go to the audio version to uh, get pronunciation, pronunciations. And so uh, that one I had to go and I knew it would come up in today's service. So I had to practice it a little bit. I still probably butchered it, but uh, uh, you, you get the. Uh, uh, the gist and um, uh, the Selah is an important part, um, and, and we'll examine that in a moment. Um, just uh, to take a check, um, uh, for people, is the screen blurry um, for a lot of you, or um, I'll just, uh, I, I can't see, uh, is that a yes or no? A little bit for me. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me stop sharing and then try and share again, sorry, okay. Is that uh, any better or no? Mm -hmm. Not better, but it's workable. <laughs> okay. Um, I do apologize. Um, again, if you want to follow along and it's not readable, if you go to the uh, uh, link on the Facebook page, that should uh, get you to the 
uh, to the notes for today and I'll, I'll work on uh, whatever's going on with our video um, for uh, next week and so. Um, so, you know, uh, let's, let's remember kind of um, what happened um, last week. Um, remember, uh, David had escaped to the cave of Adullam and uh, we kind of examined some of the Psalms that uh, David wrote while he was in the cave and kind of running away um, from Saul. And um, uh, David kind of, you know, he's, he's kind of like, you know, someone on the run, you know, and, uh, you know, much like in a movie, um, David feels like he's unjustly on the run. You know, it's one thing if you've done things and you know that you're guilty and you're running away, you're kind of escape, trying to escape or evade, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, punishment or justice for what you've done. But it's another thing when you feel like you have been unjustly persecuted and you're on the run because, um, you know, there will be uh, un, you know, unjust actions that will be taken against you, um, um, but you have not done any of the things that you've been accused um, of. And so, um, you know, this, this, this challenge was that David finds himself, you know, in this cave, in the cave, he, he gets connected um, to kind of the discontent, you know, the, the people of society that, you know, you normally would not like join together with as you know, the greatest fighting men. Um, you know, um, uh, it is. Um, uh, you know, some of you in the Boston area may know about uh, the Methadone Mile. Uh, it's the area, you know, kind of by um, the uh, Boston Medical Clinic uh, Hospital, um, and uh, there's a lot of methadone clinics there. And so, if you're um, on there, one of the challenges in Boston has been, you know, you can go there and you'll find needles and other things as people who are uh, trying to, you know, come off of their addictions are still wrestling with that. And, and so it would be equivalent of David going down to the methadone mile and getting a police and a fighting force, um, you know, from those who were the, the discontented, the debtors, um, those who were the outcasts of society. Um, but here's the beauty is that God, you know, as we talked earlier, God can take anything and mold it for his use. And some of us, when we look at our own testimonies about where God has brought us from, about the situations that God has brought us through, um, we're reminded of the fact that God has uh, made us beautiful, uh, even despite all that we've gone through. And so there's a little bit of an abrupt transition as we go from chapter number 22 to chapter number 23. I won't say abrupt, um, but basically it goes from focusing on David kind of running on the lamb to this uh, uh, in chapter 23 in the verse, the first verse is that when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and lo are looting the threshing floors. And, and so like, this seems like kind of out of left field. Um, first of all, um, why should David even care about this? Um, secondly, why was, um, you know, why was, you know, David going to get involved when his number one job or assignment right now was really, excuse me, about survival? Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because I find that sometimes in the moments where I'm before the Lord and like, look, Lord, I'm just trying to survive. I'm just trying to, you know, make it through. I'm just trying to, you know, get to the next day. Then the Lord kind of brings in these things and you're kind of like, uh, Lord, don't you, you know, like, I was just trying to get to the next day. Like, wh why should I even care about these things that are going on that really aren't personally pertaining to me? Um, but it's in those moments that God even meets us. Um, and sometimes it helps us through our struggles so that we can continue going on and continue fighting on. And so uh, this, this first section of uh, chapter number 23 um, kind of focuses on um, two times that David goes before the Lord for counsel and instruction. Um, and so what we begin to see is that there is a pattern emerging. Um, so one of the things that you um, often should 
um, look at when you're looking at scripture um, is what are the patterns that we see? What are the prescriptive things that we see um, people doing? And what are the principles that we can learn or discern from the patterns that we see? And so in this situation, we see David has a situation that is brought before him, and then he goes before the Lord. So why is David even concerned with what is happening at Keilah? And so Keilah was a fortified city a short distance away from the cave of Adullam, where David was hiding from Saul. So again, remember, God places David in the cave of Adullam, and then a short distance, um, likely about three miles away, um, there's this fortified city called Keilah. And so the text alludes to threshing floors. Um, let me just see, um, some of you might, uh, who have an agricultural background might know um, what a threshing floor um, is. Anyone um, know what a threshing floor is or care to explain or maybe have, know from biblical history what a threshing floor is um, used for or why it's even significant? To separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, and what else was done at the threshing floor? Anyone else? Okay. Well, so the threshing floor, um, you know, before the modern agricultural machines where uh, we would use to process grain, the threshing floors were their manual way of agricultural machines. You can think of those big grain harvesters that will take in the stalk um, of wheat. Um, and then from that stalk of wheat, you know, there is grain within that. And so the threshing floor was actually used and it was often um, located on the top of a rock or a hilltop. And so what would happen was um, the, the, the uh, stalk would be pushed or put on the threshing floor and they would have either a cow or an oxen or they would have something heavy that was kind of carried over it to separate um, um, uh, the, um, uh, the stalk from the grain. And then what would happen is that because it was on the, the rock or the hilltop, uh, what would happen is that the wind would separate the wheat from the chaff. And so uh, what you would basically get is the finished product of the grain, which was a necessary staple. And um, you could be able to, you know, that was used as a, a resource to eat. It was used as a resource to make uh, different delicacies. Um, you know, I don't know if they were making meat pies back in that day, um, but the, the grain was probably used to, you know, make their pastries and other, um, you know, manna um, uh, that they were eating. So. Um, the threshing floor was often a place of, uh, uh, of uh, outside raiders coming in. Now, uh, again, you got to think about it, you know, think about it in modern day, you know, in modern times, if you're going to rob something, what do you want to rob? Think of something you would, if you're a robber, what would you want to rob? Banks. Banks. What else? Jewelry stores. Jewelry stores, armored cars. So in modern times, if you're gonna rob something, you wanna rob something that is valuable. And in, in, in olden days, if you wanna rob something, the valuable thing that you wanted to get was the grain, um, was the threshing floor, the grain from the threshing floor. And so you can kind of see this picture of a more modern day threshing floor, which was on the hill, and you can kind of see the grain being uh, threshed out there. Um, but um, so oftentimes, outsiders would wait until the wheat was brought to the threshing floor, and then they would come in and they would try and raid it, because then they would have spoils to be able to take back to their land, and uh, they wouldn't have to do the work. The work would have already be done, be done for them. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, um, and so the text doesn't indicate um, who told David about the Philistines attacking, um, but we see that the Philistines said, 
This is an opportune time to attack. And we're going to go to um, the place of the threshing floor where the grain was ready. Now, um, you know, one of the speculations is that the people from Keilah who saw David as a warrior and still a protector of the Israelites may have went directly to David and said, the Philistines are coming to attack. Will you help us? Um, you know, that's an interesting, you know, thought because, you know, Saul is their king, but yet they would go to David to be able to help them in their time of need. That just shows how uh, impotent Saul was as a king um, and how even though David didn't have the title, people still saw David as the one who was going to uh, help them and protect them in the midst of everything that was going on. And so um, here, David has a situation. And the situation that is before him is the Philistines are coming to attack Keilah. What shall we do? Um, there are a number of options um, of what David could do. What are some of the options that, of, of what David could do? Run. He could run. <laughs> he could just say, let him attack and, and, and go. What else? What could David do? Well, he could stand and fight. He can stand and fight, yeah. Yeah, he could he can go in and say, you know, all right, we're gonna we're gonna help them. Uh, he could run, he could say, not my problem. You know, there's a number of different things that um, David could do, but with it, David makes it a point to inquire of the Lord. And and the writer emphasizes that David inquires of the Lord. Now, this is a pattern that we saw and, and we see throughout the scriptures. Um, and, and oftentimes the Lord would um, give instruction to the people of God about the assignments or what they were supposed to do. And so we can see in Judges 1, uh, where after the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, which tribe should go first to attack the Canaanites? And the Lord answered Judah, for I have given victory over the land. So the Lord gives an affirming word and also uh, helps them to know that they have victory. Um, we also know Gideon um, and Gideon, um, you know, went before the Lord and, and sought the before the Lord, and he had a dream. And and in that and in that dream, um, the Lord um, showed uh, victory happening. And so, as a result of that dream, um, God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite victory over Midian and all of its allies. And so, we see that the scriptures outline a pattern where people go before the Lord. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about this pattern in a moment, but I want us to see and to fast forward that as New Testament believers, there's a principle about seeking the Lord that we can discern from David's inquiring of the Lord and others who went before the Lord uh, in their major conquests. Um, so um, what we see here also is that uh, when they says that they would go before the Lord, um, there was a specific method in the Old Testament um, that they would use to go before um, the Lord. It was the uh, uh, the uh, 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 they would they would wear the linen ephod and and they would have a way of discerning. It was almost kind of like a a. a, a, a uh, uh, either casting blocks or the Urim and the Thurim um, that was used to be able to kind of discern uh, what the Lord was saying. And so the first request that the uh, David has before the Lord is, shall I go and attack these Philistines? Um, and the word of the Lord or the Lord's reply was, go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. And so David hears this word David is like, okay, the Lord has said it. I'm confident in it, but here's the challenge. Just because you hear a word doesn't mean that everyone else is aboard um, to join in with the vision. And, and that's why a good leader is not only able to hear from the Lord and understand this is the direction that we need to go, but a good leader is able to bring others along and to catch the vision that the Lord has given them. There are plenty of people who hear a word from the Lord, who hear a vision, but do not 
are not able to bring in others to join along with the journey or the vision that was in place. And here, one of the challenges that you have with bringing others along is that David, who's confident in the Lord, hears this word. And when he tells the words or the assignment to his men, here's what they said. Here in Judah, we are afraid. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the Philistine forces? And so what do you see here? He goes to his men and they're overcome with fear. Again, just because you hear a word doesn't mean that everyone else hears that same word and is assured of it. And so um, the fear of the Lord prompts David to go back before the Lord again for assurance that he heard the Lord correctly. And so we're not told the specific request that David uh, had the second time, but we are told the Lord's reply, go down to Keilah for I'm going to give the Philistines into your hand. Um, so this is interesting. Any observations that you have about this first part um, or, or, or this first section and, and David inquiring of the Lord, any observations that uh, any of you have about this? I think this can be applied to a lot of modern day things, um, whether it's man and wife going into marriage, you know, I have, a, I have a vision for us and that the Lord has given me. And I think we need to walk it in this way and go in this light to all the way to what we do in our jobs, mm. to the way we carry ourselves in everyday lives. This is the way I'm going to walk mm. and people will follow by your actions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I put a lot of that into the real world today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and the ability to get others who may not hear the same word that you're hearing to join in with the vision. And that's, that's definitely a challenge um, at times. Well, good, thank you, Brother Adam. Uh, others? I would think, um, you know, it takes a strong uh, follower or, of the Lord to not question what he heard. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when everybody around him isn't immediately saying, okay, David, we trust you or we trust that God spoke to you not to question the word that he heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and like I said, there were different methods of hearing from the Lord back in that day and that age. But, um, you know, the one, the confidence of David to just hear a word and say, all right, this is what we're going to do. Uh, but also the confidence to be able to say, okay, um, we're going to trust. Um, and, 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 you know, in the Old Testament, again, we have to translate between Old Testament and New Testament. It's kind of translating from different languages at times. Um, but the Old Testament, there were specific people that um, were consecrated to hear from God. Um, so um, oftentimes the priests of the clan, and remember in the last chapter, Saul kills all the priests at Nob. Um, and so they were the ones who were often the ones who, if you had something that you were inquiring of the Lord, you went before the priests. But also there were prophets um, that were there um, who also the job of the prophet was to be able to um, speak the word of the Lord and help direct them as to what the next steps would be. And so um, a very good uh, insight, Sister Jamie. Uh, others? Pastor, I think it it speaks also to the faithfulness of God. Like if we come to him asking for direction, that he will give not only give direction, but it'll be specific direction mm -hmm. in response to our inquiry. Yeah. And I was thinking, tying into what you said about the New Testament, how Jesus said, my sheep know my voice mm -hmm. and another they will not follow. And it's like, if we walk close enough with the Lord, we'll be able to discern his voice yeah. and know that, you know, that it unmistakably that it is him Amen. Um, and be able to, to know for sure which way we should go. Amen. Amen. It, it's good to know that the Lord, number one, cares about the things we bring before him. Um, you know, that's the first thing is that, you know, I'll be honest with you. Like sometimes my kids, like, so one of my most frustrating things, and, and again, I'm venting a little bit, and so y'all pray for me and my parenting skills. And so, you know, I've got three boys, and so usually I'll bring out three plates. 
Now, usually on those three plates are equal amounts of food. And so every time that I bring out a plate, the question is, which plate is mine? And so like, y'all pray for me, you know, like I'm frustrated. I'm like, just use your brains. There are three plates. There are three pieces of food. Pick one of them and just eat it. Like, you know, there's there's not brain, you know, brain surgery behind figuring out which uh, food to take. My son Nehemiah is laughing here uh, as he thinks of his uh, little brothers who are are the guilty parties. But um, and so, you know, I'm glad that even when we come to God with trivial things, He's not like I am as a parent because, you know, uh, you know, we go before God with the three plates and he says, my child, this is your plate. He goes before me and I'm like, figure out which one is your plate. But, you know, God is gracious um, and full of mercy. Y'all pray for me. I'm, I'm still not full of mercy yet. Um, but anyways, um, all that to say that isn't it good to know that God cares about what we would even consider to be trivial, but not only does he care about that, but that he gives us an answer. Now, sometimes that answer is no. Sometimes that answer is try again. Sometimes that answer is not what we want to hear, but he still gives us a specific answer to our petitions and our requests. And as Sister Davida reminded us, his sheep know his voice and another they will not follow. Anyone else who has a, a comment or thought or observation from this uh, first section? I guess I would say um, there's a part of uh, something that I, stands out to me is, you know, what the answer is, I guess. And mm. I, I like, I obviously think it's important to like go to God with these sort of things, mm -hmm. but basically, you know, from a, to me, it sort of seems like, okay, so these people are harassing you know, a town over, uh, you know, especially that David is, you know, going to be mm -hmm. king over, um, you know, it, it seems like the obvious right answer is to go do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, like, obviously, you know, if you just like barrel into that without taking the time to, but it, the, to request, like to talk to God about it, then that's probably a bad idea, but it does, it, God is going to probably, it seems like in general, the answer from God is going to be, there's a good thing that you can do in mm -hmm. front of you. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe not always, but yeah, yeah. But I, I, I you know, I, I think that, and I think that's a good reminder. Like, even if you think that you're on this like bigger path, or you have this bigger goal, if there's a good thing that you can do in front of your face, like mm. maybe do that mm. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, that's one of the biggest challenges is that. Like, you know, one, one of the things that I, I you know, I, I love um, Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. And, you know, when, when uh, 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 that was very popular, you know, one of the things that people were trying to find out is what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What is my purpose? And that is a great thing to know and to understand. But I think one of the challenges in knowing our purpose is that we can miss out on the steps or the stepping stones along the way that help strengthen our purpose. Um, you know, like when I look at my, one of my purposes that I have no doubt that the Lord has given to me is to preach and to teach the word of God. Um, but part of that was, you know what? Serving in children's church. Um, that was like part of my stepping stone to get to where I am today. Now, you know, again, I was a child. I didn't really understand the fullness of my purpose, but if, you know, if I did not see that, that stepping stone as an opportunity that the Lord was giving to me, then I would have missed out on some of the things the Lord was teaching me through those seasons in order to help me in the future seasons. And, and as Grace has um, 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 so eloquently um, pointed out, is that sometimes there's a good thing right in front of us that seems small, seems trivial, but is a part of what the Lord is doing. And Maybe there are purposes that are bigger than you think. Um, I happen to think that part of the reason why the Lord sent um, 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 David to Keilah was that for a season, 
the Lord wanted to get David away from Saul. And so uh, when he was at the cave, he was not in a safe space. And so God placed him at the cave of Adullam for a season. And then now he needs to move him to this different place. Now, what you need to understand is that the season might be a day, a minute, a, a, a month. It might be a year. But however long God says, go there, be there, there are purposes that you will only understand in the fullness of time. Some of you, like, you know, I, I went to different places, different cities. Um, you know, sometimes you don't understand why God sends you somewhere. But sometimes in the beauty of time, you can see what God or why God has you in a place. I remember when I left the Detroit area and came here to Boston, my thought was, no, Lord, this is not the place you, you know, like, uh, you know, you, you, you are not sending me to Boston. And, and so my, my thought was, I will just be here for a month and I will be done. Now, you know, some 15, 17 years later, um, you know, I'm looking at it and now I've got Bostonian kids. Like who would have thought of that? Like, I have to say my kids are from Boston. Like that's still weird to me. Like I wanted them to be from the D. I wanted them to, you know, use the, the Detroit slang and everything. Things are janky. You know, that's, that's what I wanted for them, but I've got Bostonian kids, but God was ordering my steps. Now, I have the beauty of hindsight. Um, thank God for hindsight, because when you can look back, I now look back and say, wow, even when I did not want to come here, God was doing something. And sometimes you've got to just trust God, even though you don't have the beauty of hindsight to say, this is where God has for me. I don't understand everything that God is going to do, but I know if God has put me here, he's going to work his plans. And so that's exactly what happened. Look at what happened here uh, in the scriptures. Um, um, uh, there it says, uh, with assurance that the Lord was with them, David and his men went to Keilah and fought the Philistines. And as past times, the Lord was faithful to his word. Um, and so verse six has an interesting aside. It says that Abiathar, um, who was one of the only remaining priests, brought the ephod down to Keilah after David won the battle. And so um, what we understand is the ephod was the priestly garb, and this was actually how it was used um, to kind of do the Urim and the Thurim, um, used to inquire of the Lord and find out what the Lord was doing. And so we begin to see that um, uh, David has uh, uh, the priests were with them and they're able to go along the journey. So let's look at the next section of scripture here. Um, so, you know, one of the things, remember Saul, uh, even though God had removed Saul as king, Saul was still technically in the office of king. And Saul had spies throughout the land and they reported back to the king um, everything that David was doing. So one of the things is, you know, there are people all in the land who are are reporting back and saying, okay, um, you know, this is where David is at. And so Saul hears that David had gone to Keilah and Saul thinks, oh my goodness, this is my opportunity to strike. And so Saul saw this as an advantageous military battle because David um, was in a town with gates and bars so they could easily surround David and fence him in. So basically Saul said, Look what the Lord has done. Uh, you know, I've got David in the most compromising position. And, you know, this is the interesting thing. Um, you know, I'm looking at it from the position or the lens of David is that sometimes our enemies will think they've got us fenced in. Um, and they will think that because they've got us fenced in, they will even think this is the Lord's doing. And so what was interesting there is you see there in verse number seven, um, um, Saul was so brazen that he looks at the situation and says, look what God has handed over to me. Now, again, Saul is presumptuous. <laughs> Saul presumes 
Number one, Saul has no relationship with the Lord. I mean, like, this is this is ridiculous. Like, Saul has not yet learned how to join in with the Lord. But not only that, Saul just takes situations and presumes, okay, God is with me. Now, this is also a lesson for us because, you know, one of the things is that God can speak through our circumstances. But one of the things that I always say, and I want you to hear this, and I, and I want to put a fine point on this, is that our circumstances can be notoriously deceiving. Do you hear that? Our circumstances can be notoriously deceiving. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that oftentimes you can make your circumstances say whatever you want them to uh, say. And so while God does speak through our circumstances, it is very important that you discern correctly what God is saying in the midst of that circumstance. Let's take an example. You lose your job. You can, you can use that to say, I'm in a fight and I'm in a battle. Or you could use that to say, God wants me to rest. You know, like you can, the circumstances can be notoriously deceiving because, um, you know, they help you kind of um, um, hear something, but there's, there's not necessarily that whatever you're hearing is always accurately what God is saying in the moment. So in the midst of, um, um, in the midst of, you know, circumstances that are happening, we have to ask God, God, what are you saying? And Saul, he didn't ask God, he just presumed. And so, um, you know, that presuming caused him to say, let's get an army and let's go down to Keilah and capture David. Now, we're not told specifically, well, I'm sorry, let me pause there about Anybody have any questions or comments about circumstances and, and God speaking through our circumstances? Okay. Um, so we're not specifically told about how David finds out about the impending plot. Uh, likely just as Saul had spies, David probably had spies in the land as well. Um, but David learns that there's potential trouble on the horizon. What is interesting here is what, how David responds. And again, what are we looking out for in scripture? Patterns and principles. Patterns and principles. So David calls Abiathar the priest and again inquires of the Lord. As he calls um, uh, the priest, the request is this, O Lord God of Israel, your serve has, servant has heard def, uh, definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. Will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard, O Lord God of Israel, tell your servant? And the Lord's reply was, he will. So, um, let me unpack that request a little bit, or, or actually, let me ask: Can can someone translate that request in a little bit? Um, you know, it's a little bit. The language is a little bit dense, um, but can can anybody like translate what David was asking the Lord in this request? God is Saul coming to get me. Yeah, yeah, it's Saul coming to get me. And not only is Saul coming to get me, but basically, well, if I'm going to give me up. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Brother David. So like, you know, think about it. Like if he's enmeshed in the people that are around him, are the people going to be like, oh, they're over there? You know, like, you know, kind of like, <laughs> um, you know, uh, my, my middle son, Xavier, um, so, you know, I was doing on some, some household projects yesterday and um, somehow, um, I won't say who, uh, but all I'll say it wasn't me. Um, um, someone was making some chicken nuggets 
and there was a magnet, um, a, a paperclip magnet um, that somehow got into the oven. Um, and so the paperclip magnet um, um, baked uh, along with the chicken nuggets and melted all along the oven. And so we were trying to get all the melted plastic pieces out and uh, we have a gas oven. And so at the bottom of it, there's like little holes where the gas flame comes up. And of course, um, a piece of plastic, you know, flies down in the middle of the hole. Um, and so, you know, me thinking, you know, oh, it'll be fine. You know, I start the oven and of course there's a fire and, you know, I'm, you know, panicking and everything else. And uh, anyways, all that to say, so yesterday I was doing my honeydew project. And again, I'm not going to say who dropped the magnet in there, but I'll just say it wasn't me. Um, and, and so anyways, I was doing my honeydew project. And so as I'm in there working in the oven, trying to, you know, figure out how to get the bottom of the oven open to try and see if I can get this piece of plastic out. As soon as the door opens, my second son, Xavier, mommy, daddy's in the oven trying to fix it right now. I'm like, man, like, you, you know, there is nothing that happens that, you know, like they won't tell. And, uh, you know, it's just like, they are instant snitches. Um, and so uh, I forgot even why I was sharing this story. <laughs> Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, but it was a good story anyway. Um, snitches, I don't know why they're they're telling about everything. But anyways, back to the story here. Um David asked the question of the Lord. Um will yes, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Brother David. Um uh will they give me up? Um so his concern was. If they come into the town, are they going to give me up? Are they going to snitch on us and tell, you know, um, Saul, this is where uh, we're at? And so David didn't get an answer to that, that specific question. And so he goes before the Lord and re-asks the, the question, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord's reply, they will. Um, so what does, Saul, what does David have to decide to do? He has to decide that Keilah is no longer safe for him to be in. And he needs to move and to get out of that place. Now, I want us to notice something very important spiritually here. In the first couple of verses, who sent David to Keilah? The Lord sent David to Keilah. Amen. Not a, not a trick question. Uh, um, the Lord, the Lord was the one who directed David to Keilah. Now, in this next section, who is the one telling David to leave Keilah? The Lord. Lord. <laughs> not a trick question again. <laughs> I want you to understand and this is an important principle. Just because God sends you to a place doesn't mean that that is going to be the permanent place that he has for you to be. It is with absolute certainty, certainty that we know that God sent David to Keilah. David didn't know all the purposes and the plans that God had for him. But it is with absolute certainty that God also says, get out of there. That God also says, you're not safe there anymore. And what I want you to understand is that when God sends us to places, we can't stop listening and just say, God, okay, you sent me here. I'm done hearing your word. I've got, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we often say, I've got it from here. <laughs> you know, I, you know, all right, thanks for the instructions. I've got it from here. But the reality is, is that 
when God gives us an instruction, we've got to keep on listening, keep on inquiring. And it may be that even when we're in a place that we know that the Lord was present with us, that in the new season, God will say, get out of that place because that place is not where you need to be. Now, you know, again, discernment is key because you know, there are some who will take this and say, well, the Lord is telling me to get out of my job. Don't leave your job because pastor, you know, you, you said this and it'd be like, pastor Joe said, I'm supposed to leave my job because you know what? The Lord ain't there anymore. No, don't, don't do that. Or don't put that on me. You've got to hear from the Lord. Now, if the Lord says it's time to leave your job, then leave your job, but don't put it on me because again, circumstances can be notoriously deceiving. Just because you have negative circumstances doesn't mean that it is automatically leave or it's automatically stay. What happened when he heard that Saul was coming? When he heard that Saul was coming, he went before the Lord and inquired of the Lord. And so um, that's a lot to process. Um, any questions, comments, or, or thoughts about that? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, this is pointing out just the um, sheer reliance that us as believers must have on prayer, mm. on constantly seeking the face of the Lord, because we are completely fallible. We live in a fallen world. Our motives are certainly corrupted by sin, but at the feet of Jesus is where we can find um, the answers that we need. And so it's just a constant reminder to pray without ceasing. Amen, amen. Anyone else? So, um, because of that, David escapes um, from Keilah, and the Bible says when Saul had told, was told that David had escaped, he did not go there. And so, uh, the next major section is the next time that, um, you know, we see uh, David kind of on his, his journey um, uh, away from uh, Saul. And so, David was forced to be a desert wanderer. Um, and this is, this is unfortunate because David was in the will of the Lord. David had not done anything against the Lord, but yet he still found himself in a wilderness season. And so, you know, again, a reminder to us that um, just because we are in wilderness seasons, excuse me, it does not mean that we are outside of the will of God. And again, that's why in circumstances, we've got to pray to discern Lord, am I in your will or am I outside of your will? And, you know, there have been wilderness seasons where I was in the wilderness because, you know, I was out of God's will. And there were wilderness seasons where I was there because God was molding and shaping and making me um, uh, into that. And so though David had to wander, God was still protecting um, him. What was interesting is um, that we see this here, um, and let me just go specifically to the text here. And in verse number 14, um, you see this here. It says, day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. Um, that's a very important part that um, the writer emphasizes here. Saul... Can yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, it, you know, it, it, it looks like it, it, David's being a little bit put upon because he hasn't done anything, obviously, to, to deserve being made a wonder. But, but if you think about it, who, who's David with? He's got a bunch of malcontents, a bunch yeah. of players, a bunch of people who can't get along with anybody else. And he's put all those guys out into the desert, into the wilderness. Now, do you mm -hmm. think they ever complained? Mm. Do, you, do you think they ever made life difficult for David? What God's doing, I believe, is teaching him how to lead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's training him how to lead. He's, yeah. he's basically herding cats, okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you couldn't come up with a harder bunch of people to lead. Uh -huh. No, that's absolutely correct. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut, cut you off here. Yeah, no, that, no, that I was true. I, I just wanted to say, I you know, it, what looked like an adverse circumstance, I believe, was, was actually God 
training David to lead for when he was going to be made king. Yeah, yeah. You know, one thing that I've learned as I've matured in Christ Jesus is that, um, I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of times that I go into things, especially things that the Lord has ordained. And personally, I feel ill-equipped or unprepared. Um, you know, I, I recognize that's not everybody. Some of us, we feel very confident going into things, but I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I go into stuff and I feel like, Lord, what are you doing? Like, I, I, I don't know why you opened this door. I don't know why, you know, you have me in this situation. Um, I, I feel ill-equipped. And, you know, one of the things as I've spent time in the Lord is I've come to realize that there are things that God equips us with that we don't even realize he's equipped us with. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we don't realize God is training us up. It, it, is, the, it is the karate kid, um, you know, the Mr. Miyagi, you know, wax on, wax off. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, it is, no, like that, that is, that is, I mean, <laughs> That was a prophetic movie, but you know, like, <laughs> like, you know, God, God spoke to me through that. And it's like, you know, we're sitting there, you know, washing cars and wondering what, what is the purpose of these things? But yet when it comes down to the fight or to the battle, um, you know, God has equipped us for that. Now, I just realized how many of you watched the original Karate Kid? Okay, how many of you only know like the newer versions of the Karate Kid? Oh wow, yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I realized like my, I uh, you know. Our, I love our diversity. <laughs> our, uh, you know, my my examples are a little dated now. You know, I, uh, you know the the Karate Kid is is not a universal, you know, something you all sat down and and, and watched. But you you understand the principle of, um, you know, God preparing us for something and. And I think part of that was that we've got to also remember that in our seasons of preparation, God is also protecting. Mm. In our seasons of preparation, God is also protecting. And so this is what it says in verse number 14. Day after day, as Saul is searching for David, God did not give David into his hands. In the season of protection, David was still vulnerable. But God says, I'm going to train you how to lead. You know, isn't that interesting? God is going to train him how to lead, but still protect him while he's learning and vulnerable. That's amazing because, you know, he could have been a place where his vulnerability and his immaturity at that moment could have caused him to come into a place where his destruction would come in. But God says, while I know you're vulnerable, I'm going to protect you so that no harm will come against you. And so uh, what we see here is that um, the beauty of it is that God uses various means to protect David. Um, in the past, God used divine revelation to protect um, David. So meaning that uh, either a prophet or through the Urim and the Thurim, um, God would speak to that and say, you know, go here, get away from here. And that's what I meant by the fact that when God sent him to Keilah, it was a divine protection. When God told him to get out of Keilah, it was a divine protection. And so sometimes there are divine protections that God has when he sends you to places. And some of you are here at Mars Hill, not just for the word that you're going to get, but also for the divine protection uh, for your heart and for your soul. And so um, God has various means um, that, that he has. And so in this particular um, instance, um, we, we have another familiar figure who comes in and God uses for divine protection. And it is Jonathan who is David's covenant brother. Um, you know, praise God for our covenant brothers or covenant sisters and, and those who are um, you know, in our common vernacular, we call them ride or die. Um, but those folks who are with us along the way and, um, you know, Jonathan had a lot to lose. Um, not only was he the king's son, but also um, we realized that because he was aiding David, Jonathan became an object of attack for King Saul. 
Um, and so, you know, Jonathan was risking a lot in order to be a covenant brother, but Jonathan saw the relationship with David as more important to be able to be connected and to be on one accord. And so, um, uh, you know, what's interesting is that David is going around, around all, all along in the desert of Ziph. And um, as he's there, Saul can't find David, but Jonathan can. Now, <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Um, I don't know if David was still in conversation with Jonathan, but somehow, um, you know, Jonathan finds David and um, the text says, and, and, and it's important, we're gonna park here for a moment, that as Jonathan went to David, Jonathan helped David find strength in God. Um, you know, this likely infers that David was getting weary from the constant running away from Saul and was feeling that he was innocent of wrongdoing. Um, Brother David, if you can get Psalm 63 for us, please. Psalm 63. Um, I want to, I want to kind of highlight, you know, one of the, one of the beauties of this portion of scripture is that the Psalms are replete with what I call David's journal entries. Um, and, you know, um, David's journal entries were not, you know, fluffy, you know, uh, entries of just, you know, God is good and worthy to be praised. David's journal entries was, God, I'm mad at you. God, you know, what's wrong with my enemies? I mean, you can hear David screaming out, God, I need you. And in the midst of that, um, God ministers to him and helps deliver him. Um, there in Psalm 63, um, Brother David, if you have that, can you read, uh, 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 it's, it's a few short verses, but can you read that for us this morning? Sure. <clears throat> oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld, and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. Mm. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. Mm. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Mm. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. Mm. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Yes. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. Amen. Amen. So you can hear kind of the desperation and, and what in the midst of it, David was saying, Lord, I need to cling to you. I need, I need you. I thirst. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a dry, a dry place. And Lord, I thirst for you. I thirst for your presence. I thirst, Lord, that you would, you would be with me. And so, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things I appreciate about David um, is that, you know, we often look at David as king. And think about the fact um, David was a man after God's own heart. But I look at this pattern that David was human. Um, you know, one of the beauties I love about Jesus is that Jesus showed his humanity. Um, Jesus showed um, the human desires. And David here also shows humanity. And in that humanity, David showed the fact that he was tired from well-doing. Um, Maybe if you can, you know, put a sign in, 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 the, in the reactions or in the chat, how many of you have ever been weary in well-doing? Um, and even more specifically, how many of us can be honest and say that in COVID-19, even while trying to put on a good face, even while trying to make the best of everything, how many of you can say you've gotten weary? Yeah. 
you've gotten weary, you've gotten tired, you've, you know, you, despite your best efforts, you just want this season to pass. Mm -hmm. And that feeling that most of you can identify with is what I believe David was feeling in the pits of his heart. It's possible that you know you're following after what the Lord wants you to do, but you still get weary. Yeah. Come on, like, you know, I, I know, like, you know, yeah. sermons try and tell you, you know, but, you know, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. I know that sermons try and tell you, you've got to, you know, be, you know, you know, come on, put on your happy face. Come on, you know, um, be encouraged in the Lord. But how many of us can be honest and say, there's a place for us being able to say, Lord, I am weary. I am tired. Lord, I am overwhelmed. My heart is overwhelmed. And you know, Galatians remind us and it says, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest you, if we do not give up. If we do not give up. And so in the midst of our weariness, um, if, if I can amend Galatians um, uh, just a little bit, it is let us not stay weary in doing good. Uh, meaning that we will all be weary at times, but let us not stay in that place of weariness. Let us not stay in that place where we're overcome, but let us be reminded that God is working together for our good. When it, when, it, when it talks about Romans 8 and 28, that promise, I know all things are working together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It is this working together for good that we've got to remind ourselves that in the midst of everything that is going on, in the midst of all that is taking place, let us not give up. Let us not lose heart. Let us trust in God. And so God will use different ways to reassure us to not give up. Don't you know that God can use a variety of different things to uh, help encourage us, to help strengthen us in the Lord? And in this particular um, situation, God sends a prophetic gift. And he sends that prophetic gift in the gift of a person. Um, some of you need to thank God for some of the friends that the Lord has sent into your life. Some of you need to thank God for some of the people that at just the right time, the Lord has brought into your life. And, 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 and at the right time, God sends Jonathan to David. And first thing that David, uh, Jonathan reminds David is don't be afraid. Oh, come on. You know, that's a word for some of us today. Don't be afraid. Um, not, uh, not only this, the second thing that he affirms is that he tells David, look, all of his father's attempts to capture him would be for naught. He says, my father Saul will not lay a hand on you. The promise or the word of the Lord was that God would sustain David and that Saul, even though he would get close, he would not be able to lay a hand on him. Third, he prophesied that God's plans would come to pass. He says, you will be king over Israel and I will be second to you. Um, you know, what is interesting is that Jonathan um, doesn't uh, live to be able to see that vision come to pass, um, but uh, David is able to bless Jonathan's um, uh, heirs um, for the kindness that Jonathan showed. Uh, fourth, he reminded David that Saul knew that the Lord was with David. He says, even my father Saul knows this. And lastly, the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. This was the third time making a covenant before the Lord, but it was a constant reminder that they were in battle together. So this was the third time they made a covenant before together. Now, one of the interesting things that I see about this text, and this is what to me is so beautiful, Jonathan comes, he comes to David. He doesn't bring a military battalion. He doesn't bring a whole bunch of weapons. He comes, he encourages David, and he goes back. So you know 
that Jonathan was on assignment to encourage David. There are some people, again, reminding you that are sent into your life just on assignment to encourage you. Sometimes they will be familiar faces like Jonathan was to David. Sometimes they will be complete strangers to just remind you God is with you a long way. I mean, what I've been amazed with is how God will send complete strangers in my life and they don't know what I'm going through. They don't know what I'm struggling with. They don't know the challenge that are in front of me and they will speak directly to it. And then they'll be like, all right, have a good day. And you're like, Wait, I need to hear more from the Lord. Come on, come on, come on. And, but I'm just so excited when that happens because it reminds me that God is with me, that even when I'm discouraged, God knows what I need yeah. and he's encouraging me. Um, let me pause there for a moment. Any questions or comments or thoughts? All right. So as mentioned, Saul had many spies in land and, and there were also those who were trying to curry favor with the king. <coughs> Excuse me. And some of some of the Ziphites who knew that David was in their land saw David was a prized trophy to hand over to Saul. And so the Ziphites, they're like, let's go to Saul. And they said, is not David hiding amongst us in the strongholds of Horesh on the hill of Hecula? south of Jeshoram. Uh, and so, oh, now, O king, come down, whatever it pleases you to do so, and we will be responsible for handing him over to the king. Now, this is what David was concerned about at Keilah, um, that they would hand him over. And Saul says, the Lord bless you for your concern. Go and make further preparation. Find out where David usually goes and who has seen him there. And they tell me he is very crafty and find out all the hiding places he uses and come back, back to me with definite information. Then I will go with you. If he is in the area, I will track him down among all the clans of Judah. And so Saul warned the Ziphites that David was very crafty. And so the text skips ahead and, and uh, what we can infer or assume is that the Ziphites had come back to Saul with more information. Um, and God always placed David one step ahead of Saul. And so David goes down to the rock and stayed at the desert of Moab. Um, and when Saul heard this, he went to the desert of Moab in pursuit of David. Now, um, David is now in a precarious situation. Saul and his men were traveling along one side of the mountain and David and his men were on the other side of the mountain hurrying to get away. So, you know, you can think of those kind of cartoons uh, where the roadrunner is, you know, like running after. And so, you know, he's running up, you know, Saul and his men are running up one side of the mountain and David and his men are running up down another <laughs> side of the mountain. You know, all their animals and everything else are trying to get away. And just as Saul's troops are coming in to get in on David, what do you see happens? A messenger came to Saul saying, Come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. Now, lest you think that anything is by coincidence, hmm. lest you think that this was just a random opportunity, what we see there is that this was a divine interruption by God. And so what it also teaches us is that even when the enemy is on our heels, when God makes a promise, he'll even make divine interruptions in order to make sure that his promise is fulfilled. And so Saul breaks off his pursuit of David and went to fight against the Philistines. David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of the En Gedi. Now, here's one of the things that's interesting about what God did. In order for God to move, God had to speak to the Philistines and say, this is the time to raid. And God had to allow them to raid. Then you had to have a messenger who comes to Saul at the right time. And Saul has to make the decision, you know, I'm going to give up the pursuit and go back and fight. And so all of those things, God perfectly orchestrated 
better than we could ever orchestrate. And so David make a, make, made a spiritual marker at this place and called it Selah Hamalakato. Mm -hmm. um, Selah Hamalakato. Now, we recognize that beginning of the phrase as Selah. And Selah is to pause, to reflect, to think about it. And so this phrase meant either the rock of divisions or the rock of smoothness. The rock of divisions meant that it was the rock that God used to divide David from his enemies or the rock of smoothness, meaning the place where God was able to allow David to escape. But whatever the meaning was, it was a spiritual marker that David used to remind himself that God was with him and that God was directing his path and it was God who gave him peace in the midst of all of his journey. And so um, as we um, you know, uh, finish here, there's just a few summary thoughts um, that um, there's so much to unpack, excuse me, in um, this chapter. And um, you know, if I had time, we could probably do a five-week sermon series um, just on this chapter um, uh, to unpack. Um, but I wanted to share um, just a few summary thoughts that um, kind of stuck with me. Um, and then we'll open the floor for um, each of you to kind of um, share any thoughts or, or insights that you gain from my lesson. So first of all, it is crucial to go before the Lord in our endeavors. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on, the, on thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Now, um, here specifically, David went before the Lord with a specific formal prayer. Um, it is not always a formal prayer that we go before the Lord in our endeavors, but it is good that as we are going in everything that we're doing, we're constantly praying out of our heart, Lord, lead me, direct me, order my steps. And, um, and that is a way of praying, uh, Lord, um, uh, inquiring before the Lord and going before the Lord in our endeavors. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say was that it's okay to go before the Lord to get clarity or confirmation of what you have heard. Um, you know, I think one of the things is that sometimes, and, and, and in certain circles, you know, some of us may have been taught, well, once you prayed about it, you can't go before the Lord again and pray about it again. Um, but, you know, I believe that, you know, this pattern shows us that it is okay to go before the Lord to get clarity or confirmation. Now, there comes a point where you have to step out in faith and God, sometimes God ans God's answer to you is, um, listen to what I told you already. And, and you know, that's the difference between, you know, uh, my kids, when I give them instruction, their first response is, what did you say? You know, and I'm like, you know, sometimes I'm like, I'm not going to answer you because you know exactly what I said. Uh, yeah, they'll say they'll say this. What did you say? Clean the clean the floor, and I'm like, you just heard what I said, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a difference between that where you know we know what God said, we're just trying to avoid what God said. Oh. And let, let's be honest, we oh. all do that. Oh. Versus, I know what God said, but I'm not sure I have clarity on what you're saying or I'm not sure that I fully understood it. And, um, you know, when David had negative circumstances, he went before the Lord to get clarity. Um, third thing is just because the Lord sends you to a particular place or situation doesn't mean that this place or situation is for the rest of your life. Keep seeking the Lord for present instructions. And so um, to me, it is don't disconnect from God. Um, you know, um, some of us, we like, you know, like we like to hop on Wi-Fi, you know, and then disconnect, you know, go to airplane mode, figure out things out by ourselves, and then when we get in trouble, you know, go back and hop on the uh, on the Wi-Fi. Um, you know, we need to stay connected. We need to stay, you know, on the network. You know, um, God has unlimited bandwidth. They're not going to charge you for an uh, overage fee for you know being too too much connected with God. Um, you know, stay connected. Um, and hear his instruction. Uh, fourth, while Old Testament figures use various means to inquire of the Lord, New Testament believers have uh, a somewhat 
of a different tool set uh, of ways to inquire of the Lord. And so, um, you know, Old Testament believers relied on um, priests and prophets to hear from the Lord. New Testament believers, um, we are the priesthood of believers. And so every, every one of us, um, part of the Reformation was that you don't need a priest or a prophet to interpret what God is saying. So every one of us can hear from the Lord. Now, some of us are more attuned to hear from the Lord. And some of us, it's kind of like we're still novices at hearing from the Lord. Now, there's a difference in our ability to hear from the Lord, but all of us have the capability to hear from the Lord. Now, the other thing that we see is that um, there are things that overlap in terms of the Old Testament of how God spoke and how God speaks in the New Testament. So God uses divine interruptions. God uses circumstances. God uses prophets. Um, and um, God uses priests in the sense of uh, in the New Testament be pastors or teachers of godly counsel. But what overlaps in the, what is new in the New Testament is that um, we have the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, generally in the Old Testament, uh, a lot of times you heard people who heard audible instructions from the Lord. And generally in the New Testament, we're not hearing audible instructions from the Lord, but what we are hearing is his word. And so one of the things that New Testament believers have that Old Testament believers don't have is the full counsel of God's word. Um, the Genesis to Revelation, the counsel of his word, which is profitable for instruction, correction, teaching, and righteousness. And so um, we have different things that we use in order to be able to hear God's voice, but God still wants us to be able to hear and to discern his voice. Um, next thing is God being with you doesn't mean the absence of enemies or uncomfortable situations. I think a lot of people assume that when I'm comfortable and when I don't have trouble, God is with me. But again, circumstances can be notoriously deceiving. You can be comfortable and fully outside of the will of God. And you can be comfortable and in the will of God. In the same ways, the converse is true. You can be uncomfortable and fully inside the will of God. And you can be uncomfortable and God is saying, I'm making you uncomfortable because you're outside of my will. And so you can't just use the circumstances to discern. You need to be able to look further and look deeper into that. So um, David had to wander from place to place, but the Lord was still with him. Um, the next thing is human nature is self-preservation. You know what happened at the fall? selfishness and, and mankind became concerned about self and became a God unto themselves. And so part of that is that people will revert to preservation even when you've done things to help them. You know, I was thinking about it. David goes into Keilah. He saves them from the Philistines. And what does the Lord say? Yeah, they come in. The people of Keilah are going to give you up in a minute. Like, I mean, I'm like, where, where's the loyalty? Like, we David just saved them, but they're just like, hey, I got to save myself. You know, so if we got people coming in, I'm sorry, David, I know you saved us last month, but, you know, we got to look out for ourselves. And so human nature, self-preservation. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I want people to be loyal, but I recognize that when people revert to their human nature... Mm they revert to self-preservation. And then finally, when God makes a promise, he is faithful to that promise. God can use divine interruptions to make sure that his word comes to pass. And so these are a few of my summary thoughts. Like I said, there's so much here to unpack, so many truths and principles to kind of uh, underline, but I hope that uh, you've been able to get um, a bit of wisdom from today's passage. And so uh, let's open the floor briefly for just kind of some summary thoughts from uh, each of you uh, as to today's passage. Um, I think today's uh, sermon spoke to me in a lot of ways, I think. And then to go back to Psalm 63, that's like a throwback for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
especially Psalm 63, verse 8. Mm. Um, my soul long for thee and thy right hand uphold me. Mm. It's like I remember reading this um uh sermon to this uh pursuit of God, not sermon, it's a book mm. by A.W. Tozer. Tozer he yep. was elaborating on this verse, basically mm. saying, summarizing, saying, you know, how uh prevenient grace, how God, you know, draws us to him first and then as we seek him sometimes like you say we grow weary and things like that mm-hmm. it's hard to see the clearer picture but that verse itself psalm 63 8 saying um while we're in the process of seeking or whatever we're going through god's right hand is mm-hmm. always upholding yeah. us Amen. as we pursue him as we seek answers confirmation whatever it is whatever situation with that we're in right now you know, whatever struggles, temptations that we're, we're going through, um, we may think that we are failing. Yeah, but we, it, it's in human nature to, um, um, it's in human nature to, uh, you know, fail in a lot of things. That's why we need a higher being to mm-hmm. look over us. We need wisdom. We need strength from above. As much as we try to pursue whatever, God is, always with us as mentioned in scriptures david in the you know him in the desert and you know even if you look throughout the um the old testament the you know in the wilderness with moses and things like that it's it's all it's it's the same in the past and today too in our lives mm-hmm. you know as we are walking this walk if we if we're walking in, a, in this christian walk that is always a bed of roses then it's like maybe there's something wrong that you know Mm -hmm. something weird that means we're not really with god like Mm -hmm. this christian walk teaches us to find joy amid Mm -hmm. amidst things that um have pain if we don't have pain then we don't learn you know it's just part of the life's life's equation if you take pain out of the equation take out Mm -hmm. there's no jesus cross in your life then you know Mm -hmm. that's what my takeaway is today Amen. that's that's you know it reminds us of the song that we sang today gracefully broken and uh, another song that says there's beauty in my brokenness and um you know the, there's there's joy in the cross that we bear and um Jesus bore the cross for us. And while we don't have to bear that same cross, um, we do have a cross that we have to bear daily. And there's beauty and joy, even though that cross might be um, painful at times, there's beauty in, in that cross that we bear. Amen. Thank you, Sister Shreen. Others? You know, I remember one time when... Uh, in, we were living in San Antonio and, and Max Lakeda was the minister. And I remember him saying this in one of his sermons. He was, um, he was out for a walk one evening with one of his daughters, Jenna. Mm. And they went out and, and they're just walking along and talking. And she's a little girl. She's three or, three or four. Mm-hmm. And, and so they're just walking and talking and, and bonding. And, and they ended up walking a little further than they usually did. And um it occurred to max that 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 was going on and so at some point he says to jenna honey do you know where you are Mm -hmm. and and jenna said no Mm -hmm. and he 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 decided to press it further and he said would you know how to get home from here Mm -hmm. and and jenna said no (laughs) and finally max said well does that scare you Mm -hmm. and and jenna said no Mm -hmm. and it, 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 it thinking about David in the wilderness, it kind of reminded me of that. And it reminded me of, of, of Jesus's saying that unless you become like little children, mm. you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And, and it, when we're talking about circumstances and, and divining God's will, it, it's little kids are very nimble in terms of, of, you know, what they're doing, what they're feeling, what they're going to do next. They're, they're, they're light on their feet. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes I, I wish, or I, maybe we should be more like that. We should be more flexible um, mm-hmm. in our circumstances and maybe more attuned to God's leading so that God can move us more easily where he wants us to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, you know, that's one of the challenges also with, like I said, knowing our purpose can be a double-edged sword because 
it helps us kind of guide us, but it also frustrates us at times because you know, we're not as nimble because it, it feels like from our earthly circumstance, it feels like we're not going towards our purpose, but um, allowing God to lead us every step along the way um, is, is something that we're called to do. Thank you, Brother David. Others? Yes, I would like to um, maybe kind of ask and, and then kind of speak on it. If mm. can, Pastor Joe may, because uh, I look at my situation, um, and then I look at how amazing uh, God was with David as as um, he was preparing David, and he would always uh, he, like the way he would send David, and then when that when that time come, he would always uh, uh, take him into that hiding place. Mm -hmm. so, so so the enemy the enemy could not get to him. Mm -hmm. So what, what I was thinking, what I was wondering, if God works with, with us as human, does he work that same way? Like sometimes we can be in situations and the situations might not be, be comfortable for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could go into that situation. And it could be, it's all right for a while. And then um, sometimes things might happen and we have to maybe sometimes like draw away from the situation and come back. Mm -hmm. And to kind of be re, re, uh, regenerate, or however you want to say it. And then after that, it just seemed like God kind of prepares you again to go back in this step. But you, each time I kind of go back into it, I go back in it with, 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 with this is something I believe that God would, would have for me to do. But then after a while, it, it gets to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say that. I don't know if God would, would be hiding me. Uh, if this is Betty running away from what I need to stay into and let let's see the power of God work mm -hmm. through whatever situation that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I get a little weary and, and, and I just get down on my face before the Lord and I would just like, Lord, um, I can't do this no more. Mm -hmm. And the Lord always reassured me that, that I'm not doing whatever I'm doing alone. Mm -hmm. But I still have that, that I still... And it's not a fear, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but just feeling like I need to be comfortable with, with everything that I do. I don't need to be, and I'm kind of feeling like I don't need to be in an uncomfortable situation. And I know mm -hmm. God can put us in those uncomfortable situations. Mm -hmm. And he puts us in them sometimes to let us know that I am protecting you through all of this. Yes, yes. But I have a way where I run. I, I run. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to lie. I run. I run away from it. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't stay. If I feel like I'm, if I feel if I feel like it's uncomfortable for me, uh, my bed would run, and mm -hmm. this place is my my hiding place. Mm -hmm. So I keep saying, mm -hmm. I can't keep running because if I keep running, I never face the situation. But I keep yet I keep doing it, and I know God is with me. I know God's my strength. I know all of that. Mm -hmm. But I still, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. It, it, we all we all suffer <laughs> from running. Um, we all um, have times where you know things get hard and, and we run. Now, you know, Brother David raised a, a, a very interesting point, and I want us to see this from the text. David got weary. Jonathan had to come and encourage him in the Lord. But who was with David in those moments? He had 600 men that he still had to lead in the midst of his weariness. Like, uh, and, and, and I want you to think about that is that, you know, sometimes in our weariness, we still have assignments that God has for us to do. And, 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 and it is like, David couldn't say, well, I'm weary, so I'm not going to lead these men anymore. And so, you know, that's why I said, it's also important for us to be able to discern when God says go, and when God says stay. And I think a lot of times we all have, we all have something that we're poised to do. And what I mean by that is that some of us were disposed to run. Um, so my Betty, as you kind of shared, um, you know, when things get hard, our first response is let's run. And, and I'll be honest, that's that 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 is, you know. 
my you know response in a lot of circumstances i get out of that thing you know it's a difficult situation i'm gonna run but some of us we we like challenges some of us we we like pressure we like you know some of us when the pressure comes on we get excited we're like oh drama is here i like drama like and again that's me drama i'm like no no i don't do drama um you know get me out of there but some of us when drama comes we're just like all right i'm just gonna stay and we just, you, and the reason why we stay is because we like fighting. We like throwing, you know, we like throwing all the jabs. And here's, here's what I'm saying, is I'm not saying either one is what we need to do. What I'm saying is that you need to pray harder because whichever one you're disposed to, there are going to be times where you need to use the other muscle if you have, if you have that per se where if you're disposed to run all the time, it doesn't mean that there aren't times where God says run, but you need to pray harder to make sure that you're not just going with your natural inclination, but you're hearing from the voice of the Lord. The opposite is true as well. If you're the one who always like, we, we gonna throw blows, you know, you've gotta be able to say, all right, let me pause before I just start throwing blows and say, God, what are you doing? So that if he says, get out of that situation instead of trying to fight that you'll hear his voice and and that's what i'm trying to say that whatever you're predisposed to pray because you're gonna be you're gonna be influenced by the natural inclination to do the other um and you know our circum god will use different means in different circumstances and so as life goes on There'll be different things that God is using in order to do those things. So very good question, Ma Betty. And, and we're right along with you. I, I understand. And, and sometimes when it's difficult to run, um, be reminded of, you know, um, you know, keep on hanging on, just like David still led those 600 men, even when he was feeling weary. Um, God still gave him the strength to lead those men who were under his charge. And so um, God will give you the strength to, to do what he's called you to do. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank God you, bless you. And I listen, I appreciate your smile. I appreciate uh, even when there's not joy or even when it's hard to get that joy, you, you have that beautiful smile. And so uh, keep on smiling, keep on trusting in the Lord. God is with you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. And uh, others this morning or afternoon. Pastor Joe, I there's so much in here. I feel like I need to revisit this all week. Yeah. <laughs> to, to really get everything out of it. And what you have said and, and Brother David and Sister Betty, it all speaks to me. And um, it really speaks to my situation. And I thank God that he um, confirms his word. He confirms what he says to us privately sometimes and what we hear in the messages on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But I'm really grateful for... Um, God's direction and his faithfulness. And I'm thinking of um, the, you know, Pastor Joan, Pastor O know this, but even me being in Boston, mm. uh, how for the six years I've been here, I've been trying to leave. Right. <laughs> and the reason why I came here was taken away a year later. Mm. I came for a particular job, mm. didn't have the job after a year. And I've been trying to get out ever since. <laughs> but Every time I would try to make a move, um, the doors would close. And like, I had to rely on the fact that I am God's child and I believe he orders my steps. So when new jobs didn't open up and there was a way, every time I tried to leave, those doors were closed. I had to realize that maybe God was closing those doors for a reason. And there was an appointed time for me to be here and in this season. Mm -hmm. And like you said earlier that, you know, when we look back over our lives, we have the benefit of hindsight to see what was God was doing. And I had moved from New York to California for a particular reason, and that reason went away. Mm. But I look back on those 17 years in California, and I see how God developed my relationship with him. And my, my through those probably the most difficult situation of my life, God mm -hmm. created and crafted a relationship with him that I probably would not have enjoyed. Um, or or developed any other way yeah but when it was time for me to leave california i knew that yeah. god was saying it is time to leave and one of the messages that i had heard at that time from
my pastor there was about, um, he used an analogy of a pregnant woman and how when a woman is pregnant, the placenta is what nourishes the child. Yeah. Um, and they're in a safe environment, they get everything they need. But when the time comes for that child to be born, mm -hmm. um, if the child stays too long, the very thing that gave it life, the placenta, that environment will be the thing that kills it Absolutely. if it does not move on into the next phase. Yeah. And that has stayed with me yeah. as an adult, realizing that we have appointed times and seasons. But like David, when he, he could have stayed in Kila and said, this is my safe place. God brought me here. But instead, when God said to move, mm -hmm. David had to move or else he would have been um, in danger. Yeah. Um, and realizing that that pattern is true for us as well. Mm -hmm. God may move us to an appointed time. And then when it's time to go, we need to hear the voice of God and move on yeah. um, or stay in my case and pitch a tent yeah. And, yeah. and trust that there's uh, an assignment and that there's something I'm supposed to learn here. And when I look back on it, I'll see what God was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I know one of the, the blessings of being here is being part of Mars Hill which would not have happened if I had left when I was ready to go. Um, but I'm also grateful for how we hear the, we learn to discern the voice of God and whether it's through the word of God or through it's other people, um, God is always speaking and that God is faithful to give us direction if we seek him. Um, and I'm so, so grateful for that. Amen. Amen. We believe and we affirm that the Lord is doing great and mighty things for you in this season, um, that he's preparing the great things that he has in store for you and that every one of his purposes will be fulfilled. And we pray a season of blessing, a season of peace, a peace season of prosperity upon you in all ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Davida. Others. This is a little frivolous, but I find it kind of aesthetically pleasing that in the process of being shaped to become the king of Israel, like David is sort of retracing Israel's steps by wandering mm -hmm. in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's more of an aesthetic parallel than anything, but you know, we, we then see Jesus go into the wilderness as well. Um, and so it sort of becomes this like aesthetic pattern more than anything, but yeah. no, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't say that's frivolous at all. I think that's, it's an amazing uh, way to see how God works and how God brings us through and also how God uses those to help us to be like David had an assignment as a leader. And so part of it was for him to understand the journey and um, he could relate to Israel wandering in the wilderness because he had gone through it himself and so that's Um, yeah, and just to kind of piggyback off of that, um, one thing that I'm really struck by as we're going through the book of First Samuel is um, all these seasons that um, David goes through in preparation for his future uh, role as king, mm -hmm. and how God shapes him in every um, in every I think like episode mm -hmm. of, say, of First Samuel, we see um, God built up. Um, his courage, God built up his faith, his mm -hmm. um, warrior-like abilities in, uh, for maybe soldiers of the time, maybe different um, or unconventional ways as, mm -hmm. a, as a shepherd. And I'm just kind of thinking about that and as it applies to even my life, how God has used different seasons of, of what I thought was idleness mm -hmm. to, to shape me and uh, prepare me for future roles um, that I would not otherwise be prepared for. So I also, one thing that um, Pastor Jody said today that really stuck with me was about circumstances and discerning mm -hmm. um, those circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also important that we be very careful um, if we, and avoid trying to put any words in God's mouth. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just because circumstances are a certain way doesn't mean that God always said. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's very important to um, definitely stay in the word because that's what makes you increasingly more discerning and wise and also to keep in prayer and um, communication with God because God speaks, you know, mm -hmm. he's not the author of confusion. And so long as you do seek him, uh, you will get clarity on 
on that purpose and that next season where you're supposed to go. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Anna. Uh, keen insight of, uh, you know, not presuming to speak for the Lord or presuming mm -hmm. to understand. And, and it's not wrong to say, you know, this is what I believe I hear God speaking um, and to act upon it in faith. Um, but, you know, there's a whole lot of people who are saying a whole lot of stuff that God is like, I ain't say that, you know. Um, and so just being careful uh, when we uh, ascribe something to the Lord. Others? Uh, just once again, uh, to everyone that, that is on the line and everyone that is listening, um, first, I'd like to give thanks and praise and honor to God. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to just say thank you, Lord, for how you have placed uh, Pastor Joe in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, as I moved here to Brookline, it would be five years in December of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and someone else led me, um, the God, God led me, but someone else through this person introduced me to, uh, Mars Hill Fellowship Church and I became, a, um, a member of the church. So I would like to just say, um, I thank God this morning for the wisdom and the knowledge mm -hmm. and the humbleness that he have placed into your heart and Pastor O. Mm -hmm. And I bless God for all of that, um. I think you are a wonderful man of God and not, I'm not trying to put you on no pedestal because I know you're not God, but I bless God for you. And I thank you every week. I think, uh, and I also thank you for brother David and, and um, sister um, Davida also coming out with some really great points in, in, in the word, which is really helpful. And I think we all as being a body of Christ that we all have something to bring yeah. to to the table of God and to encourage each other in the faith in this difficult time. Yeah. And um, I just say to all of us, be encouraged, even mm -hmm. though we all might be going through, we know that God is still with us and we know God is is, is for us. So we keep the faith. Amen. We, we keep the what we keep the path. We keep we stay on the path. Amen. It's God with you all, Pastor. Amen. I love, as I love you all. Amen. Well, you know, uh, one of the things, and, and uh, we'll have others share as well, is that you know one of my heart's goals is to see um, the body of Christ at work is the way it, it's outlined in Ephesians, that every part of the body uh, has its part of the work. And so uh, I'm glad to see others who step up, uh, who step in, and um, who uh, use their various gifts, whether it's teaching, whether it's prophecy, whether it's encouragement whether it's administration, whatever your gift may be, that there's room for it here at Mars Hill. And um, we're thankful for that. And so uh, thank you for that, Bob. Uh, others uh, who haven't had an opportunity to share this morning? I like the, uh, the discernment on on any given situation and relying on the lord in that aspect uh mm -hmm. I, I think the example that you led and i'm very much a victim of this one where i do this all the time of oh i lost my job well i guess the lord wants me to rest or <laughs> I guess there's something I guess there's something good on the other side waiting for me right mm -hmm. it's it's well you can think that but is that actually what the lord has said mm -hmm. and making up aspects in your mind um, and I've done that for a very, very long time and still do that to this day. Mm. And yes, you might be trying to look on the bright side of things, but at the same time, it's just what the Lord is really saying to you. And, and if not, then, you know, you can go into quite a bit of confusion. Um, yeah. so. Yeah. Cause sometimes Lord says fight, you know, and, and you've got to learn how to fight and, and fight the battle. And so he'll fight for you, but, um, you, you've got to do your part of the work. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, a few other sister Carla, anything from you today? Um, I um, <laughs> so just thinking uh, what stuck with me the most is that you know the Lord will send you someplace, mm. and remember that it's not always permanent. Mm. Mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. You know, you have to keep asking the Lord for, you know, present instructions of where you should be. 
and what yeah. you should be doing, but yeah. while you're in that situation, to still um, do what he's called you to do in that that season. Amen. 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 And that's it's easy to comprehend, but not always easy to execute. And um, but um, you know we keep on doing it, and with the help of our Jonathans. And uh, what, did, what did we say? Uh, Jonathan and Jamie's. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan is the, the, the female version, I guess, of Jonathan. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll call, did we say Jamie's or what? I can't remember. What was the female name of Jonathan's that we said? Oh, yeah, okay, Plasto. Plasto says she has done. We'll call Jamie's. So with the help of your Jonathan and your Jamie's, um, um, you know, they're helping uh, encourage us when, when, we, when, we, uh, when we need to be strengthened in the Lord. Thank you so much, Sister Carla. I guess that was my call. <laughs> it's funny that you said my name because, you know, as Ruby was talking about David, I kept, you know, and, and I, I kept having to force myself back to think about David because I kept mm. being drawn to Jonathan. Mm. Little little piece in this scripture um, attributed to him, but mm. so important. And so often I feel like, you know, God hasn't called all of us to be Davids. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, sometimes he's called us to be... Um, hopefully not the Philistines, but to be the Jonathans. Yeah. And that's important too. And I just, um, I, I want to just take a moment to say, I was so blessed at the, uh, when I came on and heard the music ministry, Lewis mm -hmm. and Shireen and yeah. Just, yeah, all the, the ladies and their beautiful voices just blessed me and prepared my heart for today. And mm -hmm. um, thank you for that. You guys do a wonderful job. Thank you for all the time and effort you put in because um, it really, um, it really makes a difference. So thank you. Amen. Amen. And yeah, I witnessed to it, all the rehearsals and the, the video recordings. And I had to do one video recording myself and it was, I'm sorry, it was horrible. It was, it was really horrible. So I can't imagine having to sing all the right notes and all the right facial expressions. And so we're, we're thankful to the Lord. For that. Let's see. Um, so a few more names, uh, Sister Taja or Sister Kim or Sister Antonia, any, any final thoughts? Uh, all has been said. Thank you, everyone. God bless everyone. God bless. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Sister Kim, Ma Kim. How are you? I joined a little late, so I apologize for that. I'll get it together. Um, <laughs> no worries. We're glad you're just, here. It's just nice to hear um, uplifting sermon and to hear everybody's voices and everybody is doing okay in, in these perilous times that we're in. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I hope we all get out to vote and do our part to help anybody else that needs help to get out to vote. Amen. 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 Have a good, great day. Amen. Amen. Doing our part, <laughs> our civic responsibility. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Amen. I know you're not supposed to mix um, um, religion with politics, but um, no, no, no. It's just, we, it's just kind of critical these days. So we we are value voters, and so we. Uh, we're not going to tell you who to vote for, no. um, unless you come talk to me uh, on the side. But uh, we're not going to tell you who to vote for. But we're going to tell you get out and vote. Don't be like uh, I forgot who it was. One of the basketball stars says uh, this is their first time voting. And I was like, you are forty something years old. And yeah, you know, I saw yeah. that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but his uh, name is on the tip of my tongue. Oh, too. Yeah. oh my god. Oh. Um, uh, Shaquille O'Neal. Was that Charles Barkley? Yeah, Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Shaquille. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, but you know what? I'm not gonna knock him. You know what? He 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 took the he took the first time. So you know, if, if you haven't voted before um, and you can't, it's a privilege because you know some of us on this call we're not um, citizens, so we don't have the opportunity to vote, or we're resident aliens, um, so we don't have an opportunity um, to vote in this election. And so, if you do have it. Um, you know, use that, use that voice, um, um, use that voice for righteousness, um, 
um, and goodness in the land. And um, you know, I'll speak a little bit more towards that as we get closer to November 3rd, but uh, early voting here in the Boston area has started already. So a uh, good PSA um, to remind us, uh, Sister Kim, to, to go out and vote. So. Sister Taja, will you close us out today with your word of wisdom? <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say I, I would have to kind of second and third um, what Adam and my sister Davida were talking about. I tend to sometimes be that person that gets into, you know, a situation. God sends me a place and I stay there a mm. um, long time. <laughs> so I struggle with that. And, mm -hmm. you know, just really, you know, the reminder that you got to listen because sometimes God is not calling you to, to build a house in that space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes. He, he is asking you to move. Mm -hmm. So um, just, I, I would ask for prayer mm -hmm. um, guys to have me um, just be more in tune with the spirit and in tune with uh, the, the voice of the Lord um, to be able to listen and discern when God is asking me to move. Cause I get real comfortable. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, you know one of those people that don't like change and, and change can be difficult for me sometimes so that that reminder was definitely spot on for me today and i'm not about to quit my job so um okay <laughs> thank you don't 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 blame it on pastor joe <laughs> <laughs> Taj, I'll double down on that with you. I'll, I'll agree in prayer with you on that one. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> um, but, um, you know, in all seriousness, knowing how to discern the difference. And um, um, you know, like I said, sometimes the Lord will say, build houses, plant, you know, plant. And sometimes he'll say, you know, <laughs> get up out of there. Um, and um, we've got to be able to hear his voice. So, um, did I miss anyone? Anyone I missed um, that didn't get a chance to? Um, share uh, insight. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone for um, joining us today. Those of you who joined on Facebook as well. Um, again, um, a, a wonderful insight. We're going to um, <laughs> see next week as um, saw, uh, David is still on the run <laughs> and David is presented with the opportunity to um, kind of uh, get his enemy per se. Um, and, uh, you know, this will resonate with some of us too as well. Uh, <laughs> when we got opportunity to, uh, you know, get back at our enemies, um, you know, it's interesting how uh, David approached that. We'll, we'll see what patterns and principles we can learn from that. Um, as was emphasized um, by Sister Jamie, and I, I think is also important for us to see in this text, um, not all of us are Davids. Um, some of us are the Jonathans. And, you know, I, it, it, it's amazing because, um, um, you know, in seasons, you know, a lot of times we're taught, you know, be the David, be the David, um, you know, be the first chair, be the king, be the, you know, the leader. And sometimes um, the role that God has us is the Jonathan, who's the supporter, who's the, who's the encourager, who's the, you know, the edifier. And, um, um, that role is vitally important, and I don't want anyone to think that that role is less than or less important um, in God's kingdom. Um, without Jonathan, David would not be the king who he was, and without David being the king was, God would not get the glory in the way that God did. And so um, just be reminded that as we reflect upon these scriptures, um, we all have different roles. Um, we all have different things that the Lord has blessed us with, but whatever it is that the Lord has placed in our hands to do, let's do it to the glory of God. Um, I want to specifically pray for those who are um, in this season that may be going through challenges, um, you know, as I shared, you know, COVID is not easy. Um, and so I, I'm praying for those of you who um, this season has been mentally or physically exhausting for um, each of you. Um, I want to pray for those who are um, still uh, looking for employment or, um, you know, in a tough financial season in this season, uh, that God's uh, provision, Jehovah Jireh, um, will be with each and every one of us, and that we are um, graciously broken, um, but that God is putting us together as the potter, as the clay. So, Lord, be with you. The Lord strengthen you. The Lord, make his face to shine upon you each and every day of your life. 
In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. You too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. God bless. Thanks, everyone. Have a blessed week. Thank you.